Hello, everyone. Happy holidays. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our December issue of the Sports Acupuncture Webinar Podcast. My name is Matt Callison. I'm Brian Lau. Thank you very much for coming, you guys. And thank you for the American Acupuncture Council for inviting us here. We have a very special guest today, Ian Armstrong, who's on faculty and the teacher of the postural assessment and corrective exercise class that we have in the Sports Medicine Acupuncture Certification Program. Thank you, Ian, for coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've thanks, been uh, watching you guys do these type of uh, podcasts here for, for a few times, and I'm excited to join. All right, awesome. Great. Can we go to that first slide there, please? And we'll go ahead and do a little overview of what we're gonna be trying to accomplish in this very short 30 minutes. All right, so a quick overview, and this is playing off of the blog article that Brian and I wrote for, on the Sports Medicine Acupuncture webpage, um, exercise prescription for the acupuncturist. In particular, it's for uh, when you have a patient with medial knee pain, a few different things to take a look at that can really end up helping quite a bit with um, your patients. And we're talked about a, an elevated ilium and the muscle imbalances and the sinew channel imbalances that can end up causing the knee to move in. So we're gonna be speaking about that um, and also what can happen with uh, pes planus. So um, let's, let's, as a reminder, just something about this uh, exercise prescription is that we feel that the exercise prescription is a very important adjunctive therapy for ac acupuncturists to use is it's just as important as prescribing herbs or dietary recommendations. And exercise prescription is not only just for uh, postural imbalances and orthopedic rehab, but there are also many exercise prescriptions that are exercising muscles that stimulate the front move and the back shoe points, uh, as well as she clef, luo, and uh, gene well points. So it's important that we are exercising certain areas, even for zonku components, for example, like upper jaw, um, asthma or even post COVID patients, how wonderful it would be to actually give them some exercises that gets their rib cage moving and such. Mm -hmm. And I know Brian has a few comments on this as well. So I'm going to hand it over to him. Yeah, I think uh, just to parallel that, uh, the, the space, you know, if you think about the whole chest and the abdominal cavity, you want a, a space in there for things to circulate well and move well. So if, if there's a lot of collapse in the chest, well, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the lungs. And the diaphragm, if it's if it's pushing inward, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the liver. So to have really good just circulation through the abdominal pelvic and through the thoracic cavity, um, corrective exercises, qigong, uh, tai chi, all of those types of movement exercises, which is a big part of the tradition of Chinese medicine, uh, is really essential both for, like Matt said, orthopedic conditions uh, especially, but for really any condition, just to have proper circulation and proper movement throughout the whole system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So then uh, let's go to the next slide. And Ian, do you want to go on ahead and start with this and walk us through? Sure. So when we're looking at um, some contributions to uh, medial knee pain, there's a couple of aspects that we've got to look at. Um, often the, the knee is really the joint that's just caught in between two other joints that have a lot of range of motion. They can have a lot of uh, propensity for deviation, both standing or statically, and through movement. So um, in the PACE program in SMAC, we look at both uh, movement assessments and static assessments. Um, and with these two joints that I'm speaking of, I'm talking about the hip, and uh, later on as we'll get to the, the ankle and foot. So in the first picture, we can see the gentleman here standing here with a plumb line down the center of the, of the body there. And you can see on his right side, even a little bit more without having any palpatory conformation, you can see that that right side's got a little bit of elevation. You might be able to see even a little bit on the, um, if you're comparing the, the distance between the side of his body and each hand, you can see that there's a little bit less on that right side. You can see a little bit of a fold on that right side and you can almost tell that there's a little bit of elevation of his, of his right ilium there. Um, moving to the, the picture in the middle, we can see as a practitioner, it's, it's always good to confirm what we're trying to see with palpation. You can see Matt's got his hands over and on top of each iliac crest. And again, with this different patient, we can see that you, this, this person's also got an elevated ilium mm -hmm. on that right side. 
Um, and then we can confirm these, these um, what will happen with these deviations or the imbalances of the myofascia and the sinew channels and how it's going to affect um, the movement. So in this case, we, we like to use the um, overhead squat. Uh, it's, it's often used in the, in, in the National Academy of Sports Medicine or NASM. Um, it's also a, a big movement screen that's, that's used in something called selective functional movement assessment that uses a lot of movement screens to try and help with pain and increased uh, performance and function. You guys got anything to add to that? Yeah, I do for the, uh, actually two things. For the middle picture, uh, of course, it's a nice chance to see an elevated ilium again, but also um, it really gives you a good picture of how to assess uh, the elevated ilium. Mm -hmm. Now that Matt is kind of moving off to the side so you can, you can't see through Matt, so he's moving off to the side so you can see his hands. But if you were really assessing and there was no need to take a picture and he was right behind the person, the goal is to get your, your hands really at the top of the iliac crest, not just come in and feel bone because you might be in a slightly different place with each hand, but to kind of crawl up until you sink in just above the iliac crest, sink into the area where it's a little softer, where there's no bone underneath, underneath your hands and come down on top of the iliac crest. And the finger position really tells you if one hand is higher than the other. So that's really right. showing the, uh, the proper assessment, or, you know, a good way of assessing it. Very true. I think it's common to kind of miss that that top of that iliac crest. It can mm -hmm. hide from you. So sometimes I'll even like to start at the rib cage and palpate down until I feel I'm in definite space. And then, as you can see, Matt's using his hands like 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 uh, levels that are really distinct, um, you know, landmarks of each of each height of each crest. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really helpful to get to get that clear, distinct mark and then just to get right at eye level with it when you're assessing. Yeah, you should be able to see it, but but some it's good to confirm with your hands because sometimes maybe just a little bit of the adipose tissue sits on the structure in a, in a way that can confuse you or the pant line can confuse you or something like that. So so the, mm -hmm. the palpatory assessment is really um, key. If I could add one more thing, I'd like to see if Matt has anything to add too. And this is the last thing we'll say about this because um, the rest of it will be a little bit more on the biomechanics, but the person on the left, of course, has an elevated ilium. We could look, look at the musculature, the quadratus lumborum and stuff we'll talk about as we progress forward with, um, with the, the uh, channel sinews that are in, involved. But if you kind of just think past the muscles for a little bit and think, well, his kidneys would be moving along the psoas muscle. So what's happening with the position of the kidney on the right or the liver? You know, the liver can have a range of motion that it does as you take a breath or as it slides in relationship to the stomach and the kidneys and all the organs, it can be complex, but you know, maybe that internally that, that liver is stuck down to the kidney or to the intestines and isn't able to sort of move freely. So he has to position himself in a way to sort of free and, and take pressure off that liver. And that's what we were alluding to in terms of the uh, internal to Zong Fu can really be affected by posture in a lot of different ways. Absolutely. Pelvic girdle. Um, any kind of, of, of pelvic inflammatory diseases or any, anything actually when you look at the Zong Fu mm -hmm. with an elevated ilium. So let's zero it back into the medial knee pain. With mm -hmm. all orthopedic examinations, the practitioner will be thinking about what channels are affected in excess and deficiency. And therefore you can start figuring out what points to be able to use. So this is a good segue then going into our next slide. Mm -hmm. Going into our next slide. All right, awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, so here it's going to be taking a look. You'll see uh, frontal plane muscles of the hip AB ductors and the hip AD ductors along the gallbladder sinew channel and also the liver sinew channel. So when you have an elevated ilium, you can see that the hip AB ductors will be in a lengthened and relative deficient position on the side of the elevated ilium. And then the adductor muscles, the AD ductor muscles, will be lock short and a relative excess. Why is this important to know? Because it's going to predicate your needle technique at the motor points of these particular muscles. So on the opposite side, you'll see where the ilium is on a lowered position, that glute medius and minimus on the gallbladder channels in a lock short position, pulling that ilium downward. And then you have the adductors are going to be in a deficient lock long position. Now these are only going to be in the frontal plane. Now these are, these muscles themselves are going to be directly indicated with elevated ilium 
And as the person is going into an overhead squat, what you'll commonly see is that knee moving inward. Now, there's also other important muscle that we're going to be talking about um, on the urinary bladder sinew channel. Ian, do you want to go from here? Sure. Um, I th great explanation. I think from through the wonderful artwork on the left side and then seeing the visual of me in an overhead squat on the right, you can see how the excess adductor uh, is can be pulling that knee moves knee uh, moving it in um, and the, the inability uh, or the inhibition of the gallbladder sinew channel on the glute medius and minimus to properly support that that knee and in, 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 in keep it stable. Um, however, there's other things that we've got to tease out of this because it can, it's not going to be the only culprit or it can be, um, other things obviously that, 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 that can cause that knee to move in. Again, we mentioned the ankle, which we'll get in foot, which we'll get to later, but also even looking at other kind of muscles that are attaching to the hip and, um, the, the ischium, for instance, is the lateral hamstring group. Now we know that the lateral hamstring, specifically the long head of the bicep is a biarticulate muscle, meaning it's going to extend mm -hmm. the hip and it's also going to bend the knee. Therefore, it's going to cross that knee joint. So if you can think of it as a, the string on a bow and the leg being a bow and how if that string is tightening down, that leg is going to not have the ability to, to keep straight and it's going to start to collapse that knee to move inward. Um, so there's other variations of this overhead squat that we would use to try and tease which one is being a culprit and they could both be contributing to that need to move in. Um, but we learn different variations of this overhead to squat to, to try and tease that out, to see if that lateral hamstring group, um, is really contributing to the tightness and not allowing that knee to keep straight and pulling that, mm -hmm. that knee or bow in. So that would be your, your urinary gallbladder, excuse me, your urinary bladder sinew channel. Mm -hmm. Brian, you want to comment on that? Uh, just to add to it, you know, that could of course be in the same way that Ian described, that could be the, the lateral head of the gastrocnemius also. And for that matter, pronius longus, that whole urinary bladder mm -hmm. channel on that side. And again, just like what Ian is saying, th those both cross the knee, you know, gastroc coming from above, hamstrings coming from below. So if you think of the whole channel, from the hip to the foot, as Ian was saying, you know, you can see on the lateral side, that bow, that, that line is shortened, creating a bowing of the knee versus the more medial hamstring and medial gastroc. So it'd be relative excess on the, um, on the lateral side. Right. All right. So good, good, good. So just as a reminder for everybody, what we're describing right now is zeroing in on one postural dysfunction that can cause medial knee pain that's useful for the acupuncturist to assess. Mm -hmm. Now looking at the biceps femoris, that lateral hamstring being in an excess position, what we already covered with the hip AB ductors and AD ductors being excess and also deficient. So that's gonna be important. Now, we also have to look at the constitution of the patient, right? So if we have our assessment, we do our tongue, our pulse diagnosis, we figure out who is this patient with this medial knee pain, and perhaps maybe actually have liver chi stagnation or liver yin deficiency as well, where that organ is also contributing possibly to some of that medial knee pain in addition to these partial dysfunctions. So we would be developing our acupuncture treatment plan and protocol, which we don't have time in this, in this particular uh, podcast or webinar to, to go over. Um, but after the acupuncture and a balanced acupuncture treatment and then doing your myofascial release techniques or cupping or gua sha and such, everything that we do as acupuncturists, you're now priming the body for exercise prescription. And this is really no different what our founding fathers have done before with acupuncture. And I'm sure teaching Tai Chi exercises, movement mm -hmm. patterns and Qigong, yep. we're just describing it in Western biomedical terms. Mm -hmm. So therefore, let's go ahead and discuss um, a, a really excellent exercise for lowering an elevated ilium after the acupuncture treatment, which would be in the next slide. And then this would be a nice little segue also for Brian. If you want to get ready for the mm -hmm. demonstration, we've got a little treat for you. Brian's in his office and he's going to be demonstrating some of these exercises for us. So let's introduce them first. The exercise is what you're going to be seeing. So here on the slide on the left, you see uh, Ian on a figure four wall. So his right hip is at 90 degrees and on his left ankle, you see that lateral malleolus over extra point Hayding. 
So he's going to be pressing the knee outward in order to work on the hip. The hip abductors are going to be contracting and the hip adductors are going to be relaxing in this case. So you could see on the side of an elevated ilium, if you put the person into this particular position, the locked long deficient hip abductors on the elevated side are now contracting isometrically. Now this is after your acupuncture treatment, so they're really primed and ready for this. Yeah. You've, treated, you've treated the adductor muscle with the reducing needle technique, and now the adductors in this particular position are being reciprocally inhibited. So it's complementing the acupuncture treatment. Now, if the person has lack of flexibility in this particular position, there's a number of different sequences that we can do, which Ian, do you want to follow up with that? And uh, just briefly just describe it, and then we'll go right into Brian so he can show it. Sure. So, um, I mean, great description of me on the left there. Um, when we're looking at these are other variations of what we would call figure four exercise. So you can see um, someone else here on the right hand side um, being able to um, add a little bit more of a rotational type of movement to, um, again, as Matt was saying, uh, contract and, and stimulate the contraction of the the gallbladder sinew channel with the abductors and getting that release and stretch of the adductors, again, which will especially be profound and, and, and effective once the, the treatment has been completed. Um, I, don't, I think, I imagine we're pretty ready to, to move on and, and see um, Brian here, because I would love to talk about some of the nuances of these exercises and the keys to really making sure that they're effective. Yeah, let's go, let's go to Brian, awesome. Great. So as you can see, Brian's set up here. He's got his hips flexed at 90 degrees. He's got his knees flexed at 90 degrees. Um, it's hard to tell from this angle, but we really want to make sure when someone is up against the wall like this, that their starting position is, is neutral with their feet. And by that, I mean they're not abducted, they're not adducted uh, with their feet. And as Brian's just demonstrating now, they're all lined north-south or superior to inferior. So you don't want to have that, that movement um, of, of the misalignment of the feet. It's important to have those nice and aligned and together in line with the hips. So um, running with the two examples, meaning the we saw in the first slide and in the second slide uh, with the artwork of the, of the musculoskeletal system and the, and the imbalances of the muscle groups, let's say that Brian had an elevated right side. Um, so it's, it's nice to, you notice when you're looking at the exercise in the photos before, you saw that obviously we're, we're addressing one side. It's not a bilateral exercise. You're addressing one side at a time. So when it comes to um, giving this exercise to your patients, I think it's nice to obviously have them do side, both sides, but also it's important to have them give a little bit more attention to that elevated side. We want to get more activation from that deficient gallbladder uh, sinew channel of the glute med and minimus that are elongated and lengthened and inhibited by that elevated ilium. So we'll have him start with his right ankle. We're going to have him go ahead and put his right ankle over his left knee, just like so. You can see that lateral malleolus, even with Hadding. We want to make sure that his right foot is generally flush with the outside of the thigh. And it's a good marker, so he's not too far over uh, and crossing. Beautiful. Um, and then he's going to go ahead and you know, abduct and externally rotate that hip and push down just like so. And when we're going through this exercise with the patient, we want to make sure that they're not compensating at the hip and seeing that hip elevate. I know if it's hard, you may, for those of you who are watching, you can kind of see what he's doing through the mirror there and get an idea of how that compensation can often be had. Um, with these postural exercises, you know, they don't seem too difficult and, uh, and, and they aren't. But the, the, the thing about them is, is when we have these deviations uh, for a patient, it's often that they will are used to moving their body to get out of the, 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 the crux and the importance of, of and the effectiveness of what that uh, exercise is trying to do. So paying attention to these little deviations or wiggles and how they'll try and get out of doing that, the, the exercise properly is really important to pay close attention to. Hey, Ian. So, some, yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting. You're probably just about okay. to say it, but I just want to make sure that we do cover it. Some patients 
right? As we know, have a difficult time getting in that figure four because of tightness in Correct. the hip. What, what would, what would you right. instruct to do? That's a good one. Beautiful, Brian. Yeah, exactly. He just can't get there. Or maybe he can get there, but there's so much deviation at the hip. That hip starts to really tilt up, but that's just, that's no good, right? That's not going to be effective. There's no way that they can get out of that and get into proper alignment. So what we really need to do is decrease the the angle of the leg that's not being stretched. So in this case, it would be Brian's left leg. We're going to go ahead and have him decrease that that hip angle. So meaning that the, the and taking down that 90 degrees of hip flexion and really trying to make sure that we can give proper space for their whatever their flexibility is to get that right uh, ankle back over the left knee. So and then being able to abduct and externally rotate that hip being able to stay put that transverse plane if you will through that hip is not being being deviated away from and we're getting a nice activation of those abductors the gallbladder sinew channel and that that you know openness and the release of the of the adductors in the liver sinew channel So should we maybe move on to the rotational? Uh, sure. And once the person can able to graduate from these particular exercises, then we'll go into more uh, an exercise that caught, that the person needs to have more flexibility for. So let's let's take a look at that one. Yep. So now um, Brian's in a position called a hook line position. You can see that his soles of his feet are on the floor. Typically, I would say that I like to have about. Um, 90 degrees of knee flexion so he's a little bit more than that right now that's okay that's something that's actually sort of custom to that patient again you can decrease or increase that angle depending on how flexible they are for instance if the person is not so flexible you can lengthen that 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 uh, there you go just like that's just like that brand so obviously you can see that that knee's coming down it will be easier for that patient to put that ankle over the knee and then if they're not getting enough stress you can increase that angle too right you can go the other way so going, you know, up just like Brian did allows that increase and maybe more of a stretch if that's what they need, depending on the patient. Um, so once they've found that, that right angle, you're going to go ahead and take that right ankle over the left knee. Uh, again, making sure that the ankle, that left, that left foot is flush with the outside of the thigh. He's going to go ahead and let that rotate that whole sole, that, that right foot to be on the floor. So he's going to go ahead and rotate over so that whole right leg outside of the leg you know that peroneals that the it band all of that's flush with the outside of the floor he's going to go ahead and dorsiflex and activate that right foot so you can i don't know if you guys can see through the mirror but he's 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 flexing that right foot that's off flush with the floor we want to make brian sure to, can we have brian go to the other side so we can see that sure good idea Oh, yeah, so, yeah there you go. <laughs> so he's, he's flexing that uh, that right foot now that's on the floor. The left sole of the foot should be able to stay on the floor. So if that's not being able to stay on the floor, then what we need to do is decrease the flexion of the hip angle, just like we showed in the beginning. Uh, that means he's probably too steep of an angle. It's too much of a stretch. Mm -hmm. So just like the figure four wall, he's going to go ahead and externally rotate and abduct, abduct his, his left leg. And uh, we haven't really discussed that too much about the time. So he can hold for this for about 30 to 30 to 60 seconds. Um, I really also like to give a cue for the patient to really reach with, uh, in this case, it would just, this would be for Brian's left knee. So kind of reaching that towards the mirror will sort of, sort of elongate that area um, um, and give more of a stretch, sometimes felt in the TFL, sometimes even felt more in the quadratus lumborum, which is also on that, that liver sinew channel. So th this one in regards to its difference with the figure four wall, I think sometimes people, uh, patients can feel more of the stretch moving in through that liver sinew channel up through that quadratus lumborum. Mm -hmm. You can also, if, if, if he's comfortable with it, go ahead and rotate his head towards the leg that is, is being activated. So that left side for him, as you can see, he does that through the mirror. So I feel like that, that elongation can really feel all the way up through that necessary. Because uh, as, as we can see, we didn't see in the artwork um, uh, that, you know, the 
the elevation of the ilium is also going to cause a shortened quadratus lumborum on the ipsilateral side. This is excellent. Yeah, um, we're running short on time, so we're going to have to cut that one. Um, oh, this shoot. is also, uh, this is all right, this is great. This is really good. Um, for step-by-step -step information on this exercise, we have that in the blog article on the sports mess at acupuncture.com. It's the September, it's the December blog article. So um, let me discuss a little bit real quick what we teach in the PACE class. PACE is an acronym for the Postural Assessment of Corrective Exercise. Uh, we talk about intradermal needle using Pinex needles on extraordinary vessel points to be able to uh, increase the range of motion and decrease pain. For example, if you had somebody that was in this figure four position and they had some hip joint problems or let's say some um, uh, discomfort in the hip abductors or so, you could use a particular master and confluent points uh, to help decrease this so the patient can stay in that position and um, perform the exercise successfully. So now what you're about to see right now, a particular master and confluent points I'm not sure why there's feedback happening right now, but anyways, I think it's the beginning of the video. Let's go to the next video, please. This is from the Pace class in a Chicago Smack class. What you're about to see. So my, I have left posterior left hip pain when I go into uh, external rotation. Um, it's quite painful. It fatigues very quickly. It's difficult for me to even get into this position. Hold and I'm in pain right now. Yeah. Okay. Ready? For the other side. This is the one. All right. So let's play. This could be a number of different. Yeah. problem that she was having is just getting into this position. She was feeling a lot of pain in the glute medius minimus and it was fatiguing. She wanted to actually get out of this position. So that movement is actually pretty complex, isn't it? It's rotation, it's extension, hip abduction. So we went ahead and did gallbladder 41, Sanjiao 5 on both sides and she's now able to do the exercise and stay into this position. It was really quite an interesting face that she had. It was a lot of surprise. It was good. Okay, so if that one didn't work, we would have used probably Du Mai Yang Chao or Ren Mai Yin Chao to be able to see with the extension and the abduction. You guys good? Good. Making sense? It was the points on the unaffected side that were most tender too. Uh, that's we, good we, did, to know. we did all four. But... Yeah, so the unaffected side were the most tender. All right, good job, you guys. Keep going. Thank you. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. All right, so what we're using are the Pinex needles by Saren. Um, the distributor for that is LAS OMS. LAS OMS is the sponsor for the Sports Medicine Acupuncture Certification Program. That's the size needle that we normally like to use. People, um, it will stimulate the receptors enough, the extraordinary vessel master and confluent points enough um, and it's usually painless for the patient when they're doing exercises. So I know I know that we've gone over time everybody I really apologize but we only have like three or four more slides so let's go ahead and finish this up. Um, let's go to the next slide please. Ian you want to take this over for the biceps femoris? Sure we've just got a couple examples here of some um, some good bicep, uh, bicep femoris stretches. Again, understanding that with its bioarticulate nature and how it crosses the knee joint, it can be a culprit for that knee moves in as well. So, you know, there's a variety of different ways to address the bicep femoris in terms of trying to get it a little bit 
more lengthen and, and, and not pull, have so much tension to pull that knee in um, or to move that knee in. So, um, you know, there's a variety of other ones, but these are just a couple of examples um, that you can do to, to try and, and, and solve that side of the knee moves in from the hip. Yeah, we don't have time to, to go into all the assessment for it, but there are ways in the overhead right. squat to change things to really tease out. Is this more coming from the, the UB, you know, biceps femoris, uh, gastroc uh, area, or is it coming more from the uh, liver gallbladder uh, the channel sort of aspects? And it could be a, a combination of both, both, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You want to so move let's go to the next slide so we can see this. Yeah. Go for it, Ian. So um, as, as we, we mentioned, there's, we've talked about some of the different things uh, from, or different aspects from the hip that can cause that knee to move in. Um, we can also be looking, as we mentioned before, at, at the foot um, and how it can you know, be a contributor to, to that knee moving in. So on the left side, we're looking at um, the uh, Pes planus um, and also sort of the foot abduction uh, being part of that issue to move that knee, the knee moves in. And sometimes even if you don't see um, any, any pes planus or, or you know, from a standing posture or a foot abduction from the standing posture, when someone goes into an overhead squat, the, the tightness of that whole um, lower urinary bladder sinew channel will come to light and you'll see that foot abduct and even maybe start to, to collapse and pro over pronate. Um, so that would be, you know, restriction and tightness from the urinary bladder sinew channel, like your peroneal groups, your lateral gastroc, some of the things that we mentioned that, that could take that uh, and tightness and pull that knee in. Good. Yeah, Brian, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, quick, uh, a little change of subject, I guess, but a quick uh, question popped up about uh, the previous example. It was Sanjiao 5. Uh, there was a question of a Sanjiao 5 or 6. Sanjiao 5 and gallbladder 41. And typically in the corrective exercises when there's difficulty for various reasons, that would tend to help with more rotational aspects, mm -hmm. rotational problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the protocol for this is in chapter four of the sports medicine acupuncture textbook. And this is something that we also teach a lot during each one of the uh, PACE series in the sports medicine acupuncture certification program. Going back to this slide, let's take a look at the image on the right. Let's just put our, our, our assessment and uh, clinician hat back on. When you've got that patient with medial knee pain, and they go into an overhead squat and you see that knee moving inward or possibly that foot then goes into abduction that starts to move out. That's really mm -hmm. demonstrating a lot about the sinew channels that we discussed already, but let's look at it a little slightly different way. Is that we saw that as Ian was mentioning earlier that the adductor is gonna be in a lock short position. It's gonna be excess pulling that knee inward. The biceps femoris being part of the urinary bladder sinew channel is also pulling, pulling that knee inward. So therefore that also means that the medial hamstrings are gonna be deficient. Now that entire mm -hmm. UB myofascial sinew channel, even all the way down into the foot, all right? So that lateral musculature of the urinary bladder sinew channel will, will be in an excess position, which I believe is uh, information that we discussed in a PES planus webinar that Brian and I discussed in that. Oh, right. In that in the PES mm -hmm. Planus mm -hmm. webinar of a few months ago. So you can always go back and, and take a look at that one as well. There'll be more information about needle techniques and such and how it'll lift the arch with yeah. that. So you've got a, a whole treatment protocol locally just to be able to treat this. And again, you're always going to try to link this to the organs because nine times out of 10, there's always going to be some kind of organ disharmony that the licensed acupuncturists can treat this traditionally as treat traditionally as well in addition to this uh, very western biomedical way of looking at things anything else yeah, boys, think, or should we go, go yeah, on to the next think, uh, slide just, just to highlight that ian ian's demoing the overhead squat and i don't know ian if you were just doing that for the picture or if you have a tendency for the right knee to move in but kind of what matt was saying um, if oh go ahead I was going to say it's probably both. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think probably I have more of a tendency of that foot to move out. And I think it was probably from yeah. trying to demo that me he moves in. But yep. So just to highlight, you know, through other assessments, we can tease out if this is more a, a balance between abductor and adductor. And maybe 
this patient has signs of liver cheese stagnation or liver blood deficiency. So you're really putting all of it together. You know, this is this becomes just another assessment that ties into the uh, the full tongue pulse questions, all of that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. So our next slide, what we're going over is one quick exercise, which I think we actually taught in a previous webinar, but is such a great exercise for that uh, foot abduction or pes planus piece. Um, so we've actually got two more slides, but let's start with this one that we're on right now. Um, Ian, do you want to go ahead and take it over from here? Sure. Um, we call this uh, inchworm in the PACE uh, seminar series. It, it, you can also, I think, be looking it up if it's something that you want to learn about. Sometimes it's also called a short foot exercise. But the first uh, picture on the left-hand side, that's the, that's the beginning uh, that's the that's the beginning photo or a starting position. Um, you know, patient can be sitting um, e even if they'd like to with their foot on the floor. Um, standing is just fine too, um, and really making sure they're getting all parts of the foot that heel, maybe just under that big toe, and part of that, uh, you know, right around UB sixty four. Um, that part of that foot should also be planted on the floor. And what they're going to go ahead is, and you can see in the second picture is that that big toe is starting to scrunch. So what really you're doing is you're starting to get activation. And we've talked a lot about the tightness or the restriction from the urinary bladder sinew channel causing that foot abduction. And what we didn't mention, it was talked about, I think, in the previous uh, seminar that, that Matt mentioned through um, and the American Acupuncture Council here is that the spleen and kidney sinew channels are ones that we're trying to, to activate. And, beginning of, of those channels, we have the abductor halcus and the flexor halcus brevis. Um, so we're really trying to activate the flexor halcus brevis and the abductor halcus to try and get that activation and, and flexion of the big toe in that medial arch. Uh, so they flex that toe forward and then they go ahead and, and lift and fall through. So it's almost like you're inchworming your foot, hence the name of the exercise. So you go ahead and scrunch that toe, kind of follow it up with the heel and then go ahead and lay that toe flat again and repeat maybe three, four times one way, and then actually start to crunch and push it back as well. So you would go both directions. Cool. Yeah, now yeah, Brian's got a modification to this. Oh, sorry about that. Brian's got oh, a modification okay. for okay. this one. Uh, Brian's got a modification for this. So let's go to the next slide. Brian, you wanna go? Yeah, so in this one, you if, if you kind of see the ghost image on the top corner, that is foot uh, abduction, abduction. So you're flattening as much as much of the medial arch as you can. You're exaggerating that pes planus and really collapsing that medial arch as much onto the floor as you can to give yourself something to move out of. And then you're sweeping the the foot along the, the floor. It's not as much a leg rotation as trying to use the foot muscles to curve the foot to make the foot like uh, going from a long position where the medial arch is flattened to the floor to lifting and, and shortening that medial arch. So you're like fully contracting that medial arch and the muscles that Ian mentioned, abductor elusis, uh, mm -hmm. primarily in this one, I think, and probably a little bit of flexor uh, elusis brevis. Mm -hmm. And then you could repeat it, turn the foot back out, flatten the arch as much onto the floor as possible, and then make one big sweeping motion to where you're turning it in. Yeah. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, this was, we gave a, a, a lot of information and just a super quick overview for those patients that are coming in with medial knee pain. Uh, please take a look at the hip for an elevated ilium. Please take a look at the foot for going mm -hmm. into foot abduction. Make sure that you are looking at the channels that are affected with this as we described. Make sure that you also are treating the patient's constitution with this because that does make tremendous changes. And we're not just treating it locally. Uh, that's going to inhibit us quite a bit. So let's remember our roots in traditional Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, gosh, we went we we went over. I'm sorry, everybody, yeah. but you know this surprise, is really good surprise. surprise. Yeah, Ian, Ian, thank you so much for coming on. Really, really appreciate you yeah, very much. You. Oh, it was yeah. my pleasure. I was very excited to join with you guys. I, I yeah, it was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, good. Brian, you as well. It's always a yeah, pleasure thanks, speaking man. with you. And we want to thank the American Acupuncture Council um, for, again, inviting us to be able to do this. Um, and also for next week, we've got Jeffrey Grossman coming in for the American Acupuncture Co Council. So make sure you uh, tune into that as well. You guys, thank you very much. And we will see you in January. Happy New Year's. Yeah, happy happy New Year. holidays, everybody. <laughs> thanks, guys.